Hello viewers, today we shall discuss William Shakespeare's play King Lear. It is one of the texts that you have to study as part of course 1 British literature. As you know, this play is one of the famous tragedies of Shakespeare. It is in fact cited as the most powerful tragedies of Shakespeare. Before we go ahead to view an enactment of scene 1, a part of scene 1 from the play, let me introduce the play to you. In the course material which we have given you for this particular course, you must have come across the introduction to the to Shakespearean drama. But before we speak about Shakespearean drama in general, let us go back to Aristotle's definition of tragedy. You may ask why do we need to do that? It is because all definitions, all tragedy is viewed against the definition of Aristotle. Here is Aristotle's definition of tragedy. A tragedy then is the imitation of an action that is serious, complex and of a certain magnitude in language embellished with each kind of artistic ornament in the form of action and not in a narrative form with incidents arousing pity and fear wherewith to accomplish the catharsis of such emotions. Let us look at each component of this definition and examine it more carefully. In summary, what Aristotle's definition of tragedy has said is, it imitates a serious and complex action of a considerable length. It uses poetic language. It is presented in a dramatic form rather than narrative form. It arouses pity and fear and thereby purges or cleanses emotions of audience. Let us try and relate this definition of tragedy to Shakespeare's plays. When we move ahead to the plays of Shakespeare, we notice that Shakespeare wrote most of his major tragedies between 1604 and 1608. They are generally regarded as the finest of tragedies. The names I am sure you are familiar with are Hamlet, Othello, Macbeth, King Lear. Of course, King Lear is the play which we are going to look at in greater detail. You must have noticed that all these plays are named after the principal characters. The hero is the person about whom the tragedy is written. Let us relate as I said Aristotle's definition of tragedy to the plays that we are going to look at in particular that is Shakespeare's tragedies. The hero is morally admirable at the beginning of the play. We have for instance Macbeth, the general, the Scottish general. We have Hamlet, the prince of Denmark. We have Othello and we have King Lear, the king of Britain. What happens in the course of the action of the play is the fall of this great character from the position in which he is due to a fault in his character. This flaw is a trait of human nature, but in the hero it grows to excess and causes his and results in his fall from the earlier status. The downfall is due to a combination of reasons. It could be the events that occur, the situation that he is put into or it could also be because of powers beyond his control. But it is also due to, as I said earlier, the flaw or the fault in the character. And these flaws which we notice in the plays of Shakespeare, in the tragedies of Shakespeare are as follows. In Hamlet, it is his desire to take revenge and his indecisiveness, his indecision, inability to take action. In Macbeth, it is overvaulting desire or longing for 
power and position, his ambition, his great ambition which causes his downfall. In Othello, it is his jealousy and in Lear, in King Lear, it is his lack of judgment and his very great anger. It is these qualities of Lear which we look at more closely when we watch the enactment of a part of scene 1. A Shakespearean tragedy also includes, unlike the Aristotelian tragedy, a Shakespearean tragedy also includes humorous scenes or comic relief such as the porter scene in Macbeth. We have the grave digger scene in Hamlet and of course, the clown scenes in King Lear. The tomfoolery or the apparent outward tomfoolery of the clown in King Lear is, is an attempt to reduce the degree of tension that is created on account of the seriousness of action. This of course, goes a little against what Aristotle had said about seriousness, a continuous seriousness of action. When we examine Aristotle's definition about the arousal of pity and fear, we and relate it to the play King Lear, we notice that on account of his fall from his earlier position as a king, gradually through the story, we see Lear moving uh, greater and uh, or uh, arousing greater feelings of sympathy and uh, uh, pity for him. As the audience watch, they begin to feel greater degree of pity, sympathy and sorrow for the plight that he is in. Till ultimately of course, when he loses his power of reasoning, he begins with a stage where he thinks, where he believes that he has command over his reasoning and he is being very, uh, very logical in the way in which he divides his kingdom. As we go ahead in the play, as we move on towards the fifth act, we notice that this pride in his reasoning is lost as he gradually moves to a state of madness. In fact, perhaps if we study the play more carefully, we notice that at the time when he is proud of his reasoning, it is a moment when he actually does not ha use his reasoning to the best effect because what he believes to be a great decision, the decision to break up his kingdom and divide it among his daughters is the moment when his tragedy begins. And at the moment when towards the end of the play, when he, when the tragedy befalls him, when he has reached the state of what appears to the people at large as madness is the moment when he is closest to nature and when he is actually closest to being logically at a stage when he can see best, when he can perceive the reality in life in the universe around him. This then is the tragedy of King Lear. Let us look a little more closely at the sum of the characters and also at Lear particularly. Much has been written about the first scene of the play. In almost all the plays of Shakespeare, we find that the first scene sets the tone of the play. In the first scene of King Lear, which we will see enacted shortly, we find that there are a number of characters. The three women characters are the three daughters of King Lear. There is of course, King Lear himself, there is Kent, there is Gloucester and there is the son of Gloucester. Much has been said about the first scene of Lear itself. Lear is the king of Britain and he has taken a decision to divide his kingdom amongst his three daughters. The two daughters, Gonril and Regan are the, are the evil characters if you want to call them that and there is his favourite daughter Cordelia. He wishes to hear from each of them, he sets them a test. He wishes to hear from each of them how much they love him and as would be expected of them, being the characters that they are, Goneril and Regan pretend to profess their love for him. When it comes to Cordelia's turn, she tells him, that she loves him no more, no less than she ought to. And the answer that Cordelia gives shocks Lear and he revolts in anger and decides to distribute 
her share to the other two daughters. He has where on the one hand he is very happy to hear his two elder daughters speak flatteringly of their love, flatteringly of him and to confess or to profess their love of him for him and even to the extent of saying that they love him more than anyone else. We have Cordelia's aside at this time where she says, why are you married then if you love your father more, which is again an ironic comment on what her sisters say. Leah is shocked, Leah is shocked at the answer which Cordelia gives. When she says, I love your majesty according to my bond, no more, no less. He is enraged, he is furious with her answer and he withdraws her share of the kingdom to divide it amongst her sisters. Cordelia accepts what Leah says without much ado, she does not protest, she does not disagree with him, she does not uh, take up issue with him. It is however, Kent who has placed himself in the position of an advisor to the king. Kent suggests, he says, withdraw your punishment, do not punish your daughter in this way and in return he is banished from the kingdom. Many critics feel that this is the first instance of Lear's blindness to truth and honesty. It is the first example of his inability to see the truth, to perceive what is real and what is in front of his, in his inability to reason and to understand. Again, as I said earlier, it contrasts with his ability later during what is termed his period of madness, when he moves closer to the state of madness, he is perhaps able to perceive truth and honesty much more clearly, because he is closer to nature then. He decides that he is going to leave his kingdom and go and spend time with his two daughters amongst whom he has distributed his kingdom. And of course, what follows is there in the play which you will read, which you will have to read, the original play which you will have to read as a part of your course. Let me now tell you what exactly you are going to view. You are going to view a part of scene 1, which has been enacted by a group of students, students like you perhaps, who have read the play and are students who are, who have been a part of a course where King Lear was prescribed for study. They are amateurs and they have enjoyed enacting the play for you. I hope you will enjoy watching this play too. Many critics have commented about the play Lear and about King Lear's character in the play. In fact, Kenneth Muir, one of the early critics of uh, Shakespeare, who writes about King Lear, talks of reason in madness, referring to Lear's comments of the, at the, in the latter part of the play. If we invert the comment, we can see that it applies to the first few scenes, where he shows madness in reason. I mentioned this earlier as well where it seems as if there is a certain madness in the decision of King Lear, when he decides in anger, in vanity, in pride, to distribute the kingdom of which he is the ruler between amongst his daughters. The decision itself is a wrong decision, critics have said. When we move to the later stage of the play, where he is in the storm, we find that Lear tears his clothes, he wants to be as close to nature as possible. He wants to, there is a lot of reasoning in his madness, a reason in his madness, when he begins to feel that he must get as close to nature as possible. He feels the fool and he are close, because they are both human beings. And this ability to see into the way of the world, to see into the, into the heart of things is what shows that he has risen in some senses as a human being, though he has fallen from great position, the position of a king. In some senses then, the tragedy of Lear, when he finally looks at the body of his daughter, when Cordelia dies and he holds her and he cannot recognize that she is dead and he feels, I think it is my daughter and he, he talks as a madman. 
it is this progression into madness, which is in a sense a movement into reasoning as I said, that brings pity into the hearts of those who watch, who observe, who watch the play. And in that sense, the play fulfills what Aristotle believes a tragedy should do. Therefore, what we said at the beginning of this program, we spoke to you about Aristotle's definition of tragedy. Perhaps Lear, because of the intensity, the depth of its emotion, comes closest to becoming an Aristotelian tragedy. We hope you have enjoyed listening to this program and will watch the rest of it, watch the enactment of the scene, first scene with great pleasure. We take pride in presenting an excerpt from Act 1, Scene 1 of Shakespeare's great tragedy, King Lear. Lear is old and wishes to divide his kingdom among his three daughters, Goneril, Regan and Cordelia. He asks his daughters to express their love for him. The older daughters, Goneril and Regan, express their love and flattery by telling him in overblown terms that they love him more than anything else. Then comes the turn of the youngest and the most loved daughter, Cordelia. But Leah is shocked when she says, I love your majesty according to my bond, no more, no less. Leah asks her to reconsider her stance, but Cordelia remains silent. He rashly disowns her and divides her portion between the two elder sisters. The Earl of Kent stands up for Cordelia and is banished by the king for doing so. Now, we present to you an excerpt from Act 1, Scene 1 of King Lear. I thought the king had more affected Duke of Albany than Cornwall. Yes, it did always seem so to us. But in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which of the dukes he values most. For equalities are so weighted that curiosity in neither can make choice of either's mighty. Is this not your son, my lord? His breeding, sir, hath been at my charge. I have so often blessed to acknowledge him that I am brazed to it. Do you smell any fault, sir? I cannot wish the fault on none. The issue of it being so proper. But I have, sir, a son by order of law, some years elder than this who it is no dearer in my amount. Do you know this noble gentleman, Edmund? No, my lord. My lord of Kent, remember him hereafter as my honourable friend. My services to your lordship. I must love you and show to know you better. Sir, I shall study deserving. He had been out nine years, and he away shall again. The king is coming. Of France and Burgundy Gloucester. Shall my liege? Meantime, we shall express some darker purpose. Give me the map there. Know then. We have divided our kingdom into three, and it's our first intent to shake all kids and business from our age conferring them on younger strands while we unburdened crawls towards death. Our son Cornwall and you, our no less loving son of Albany. We have this hour a constant will to publish our daughter's several dowers so that the future strife may be prevented now. Princess, France and Burgundy, great rivals in our youngest daughter's love. Long in our courts have made their amorous sojourn, and here ought to be answered. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both of rule, interest of territory, and case of state, which of you shall we say that love us most? Gondril 
our eldest born speak first. So, I love you more than words can be in the matter, dearer than I said space and liberty, beyond what can be valued rich or rare, no less than life, with grace, health, beauty, honor, as much as a child ever loved a father found, a love that makes breath poor and speech unable, beyond all manners of so much, I love you. What shall Cordelia do? Love and be silent? Of all these bonds, even from this land to this, which shadowy forests and champagne wretched, with plenteous rivers and wide skirted meads, we give thee, lady, to thine Albany's issue, be this perpetual. What says our second daughter, our dearest Regan, wife to Conwell? Speak. So, I'm made of that self metal as my sister, and prize me at her word. In my true heart, I find she names my very deed of love. Only she comes too short that I profess myself an enemy to all other joys which the most precious squire of senses possess. I find and find I'm alone felicitate at your dear Heinz's love. Then poor Cordelia, yet not so, since I'm sure my love is more richer than my tongue. To thee and thine hereditary ever remain this ample thought of our fair kingdom, no less in space, validity and pleasure than the comfort and convent. Now our joy, although the least but not lost, to whose young love the wines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interested. What can you say? To draw a third more opulent than your sisters. Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing comes of nothing. Speak again. Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond. No more, no less. Ho, ho, Cordelia! Mend your speech a little. Lest it may mar your fortunes. Good, my lord, you have begot me, bred me, and loved me. I return those duties as I right fit. Obey you, love you, and most honor you. Why have my sisters' husbands, if they say they love you all? Happily, when I shall wed, the lord whose hand shall take my plight, shall carry half my love with him, half my care and duty. Sure, I shall not marry like my sisters, to love my father all. But goes thy heart with this? I good, my lord. So young and so untender? So young, my lord, and true. Let it be so. Then thy truth be thy dower. For by the sacred radiance of the sun, mysteries of Hecate and night, from all the operations of the orbs, from which we do exist and cease to be. Here I disclaim all my personal care, propinquity, and property of blood. And as a stranger to my heart and to me, hold thee from this forever. Good my liege. Peace, Kent. Come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery and hence avoid my sight. So be my grave, my peace, as here I give her father's heart from her. Call France, who stars? Call Burgundy, Cornwall, and Albany, my two daughters' daughters may digest this thought. Let pride, which he calls plainness, marry her. I do invest you jointly with my power, preeminence, and all the large effects the truth with majesty. For ourselves, by monthly course, with reservations of an hundred nights, by you to be sustained, make shall our abode by due turns. Only we shall retain the name and all the additions to a king, the sway, revenue, and execution of the rest. Beloved sons, be yours. Child Lear, 
whom I have ever honored as my king, loved as my father, as my master followed, as a great patron, that on in my prayers. The bow is bent and drawn, make from the shaft. Let it fall rather, though the folk in wait, the region of my heart. Weakened and manly when the leer is mad, what wilt thou do, old man? Thinkest thou the duty shall have dread to speak when forward to flattery bows? To plainless harness bound when majesty falls to folly? Reserve thy state, and in thy best consideration, check this hideous rashness. Answer my life, my judgment. Thy youngest daughter does not love the least, nor are those empty hearted whose low sounds reverbs no hollowness. Can turn the life no more. My life, I never held but as a pawn to wage against thine enemies. No fear to lose it. Thy safety being the motto. Out of my sight. See better later. Let me still remain the true blank of thine eye. Now by Apollo. Now by Apollo King. O vassal miscreant. Yes, sir. Prepare. Do. Kill thy physician and the fee bestow upon fall disease. Revoke thy state, or else I can vent clamor from my throat. I'll tell thee the dost evil. Hear me, recreant, by thine allegiance, hear me. Since thou hast sought to make us break our vow, which we dost never at, and with strange pride to come between our power and our sentence, which not our nature nor our place can bear. Our potency make good. Take thy reward. Five days we allot thee. Make provision to shield thee from the diseases of the world. And on the sixth day to turn thy hated back upon our kingdom. And on the ten day following, if thy banished trunk be found in our dominions, the moment is thy death. Away by Jupiter, this shall not be revoked. Where they went, King, since the star will appear. Freedom lives hence, banishment is here. The gods to their dear shelter take thee away, that justly thinkest and hath most rightly said. Thus Kent, O princess, bids you all I do. Will take his whole course in a continuum.